So now we're going to shift to talking about clinical trials and, and novel targets focused on molecularly defined patient subgroups. So Dr. Brown, can you talk about any emerging CLL trials targeting specific molecular subgroups? And also, how can CLL experts stay updated on these advancements in clinical trials? So as you heard from Dr. Coombs, there's increasing interest in looking at high-risk patients in particular, and I think looking specifically at patients with P53 aberration in dedicated clinical trials, it's become increasingly clear that the behavior of the disease when it's higher risk based on P53 mutation, NOTS mutation, IGHV status is, is quite different, particularly with time-limited therapy compared to lower risk disease. And so having dedicated trials that evaluate outcomes specifically in certain of these subgroups is increasingly important. We do have more trials than we used to focusing specifically on P53 aberration. My personal belief is that we would be well served to have trials separately in the IGHV groups that Dr. Coombs mentioned, although that has not gained as much traction. And then what we are seeing is now that there are resistance mutations, it actually has turned out that some of the drugs that we use in that setting, venetoclax and pertubrutinib, seem to have pretty similar activity in patients with and without the mutations. But as drugs are being studied in this context, there's been an increasing tendency to study them in specific subgroups. So patients who have the mutation and had clinical progression on a covalent inhibitor, patients who don't have the mutation and had clinical progression, patients who may have come off their covalent inhibitor for adverse events who may not actually be resistant. What is their response to the next line of therapy? And so all of that is just helping us understand in a more nuanced way what the best benefit for patients will be as we look at these different subgroups of patients. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Appreciate that. Dr. Coombs, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, so I echo all of Dr. Brown's comments, and um, I think I'm kind of the person that is bringing all the practical aspects of CLL care because it's she's so thorough. Um, I just always like to contribute a few little pearls. Um, so, you know, pertubrutinib has been an exciting drug um, to see it become available for our double refractory patients. So the current FDA indication is for patients failed by not only a covalent BTKI, but also venetoclax. Um, but it's the first BTK inhibitor that we can effectively use in the setting of a prior BTK inhibitor. And that's because of this unique aspect where instead of forming a covalent bond at the C481 residue, it binds reversibly and we can still see activity. But the, the practical aspect is that that's not an effective strategy when you have a patient progressing on, say, a brutinib. You can't switch them to a Cala or Xanu because of their uh, shared mechanism of resistance. They're all covalent inhibitors. They all uh, share uh, the same mechanism of resistance. And so that's one uh, thing I'd like to bring up. However, there's a very different and very common clinical situation that I encounter really a lot in my clinic, which is intolerance. And so that's where it would be a very effective strategy to switch a patient from one covalent drug to another. And so literally in the past you know, couple of weeks of clinic, I've had patients with chronic longstanding toxicities to abrutinib that perhaps went you know, under-recognized where I say, hey, you've had um, you know, notice your blood pressure has gone up a lot. Let's switch you over to a calibrutinib or other patients. Oh, you've had issues uh, with atrial fibrillation. It, you know, let's try switching you to xanabrutinib um, because the, the rates are a lot lower and a lot of patients can have improvement or just complete resolution of, of the prior side effect. And so I uh, hope that that um, emphasizes this is something that we think about every day and switching is appropriate in the setting of intolerance. It's not not appropriate when you're staying in the covalent class to switch in the setting of progression, but PERTO being a non-covalent inhibitor is uh, certainly very effective after a covalent. Um, and I think once we see um, readout of some of the ongoing phase three trials, we may be able to use it in that setting under an approved FDA label, though that is uh, uh, to be seen in the future. Mm -hmm.